We are starting basically, but let's first revise things that we have done in the previous class. Let's revise the important things that we have done in the previous class. So, we said what's a corporation and we said what's the role of your future boss. We said that this, there are specific new things that deal with corporations that corporations have introduced compared to the sole proprietorships and partnerships and the most important ones were the, this limited liability and this split of ownership and management. Next, we basically talked about how do we compound things, how do we calculate interest rates and using this new defined methodology we have introduced the concepts of present value and future value. And we have said what are the goals of the corporate governance, basically to increase shareholders' value. Now, let's look at, let's just remind ourselves how we do, how we calculate interests. So imagine you have $100 in a bank for two years and three months if the nominal interest rate is 8%. Well, it turns out that in order to be able to tell how much money you will get after two years and three months, you actually need to know how frequently your bank is doing the compound. This is if the bank tells you nominal interest rate. So, if bank compounds quarterly, that means that the quarterly rate will be 8% divided by 4. And we have to put everything to the power of 9, because we have 2 years and 3 months. This is 9 quarters. If we do everything monthly, what is the monthly rate? And then we put it to the power of number of months, which is 2 years, 3 months. This is 27 months. The same goes daily and continuously. And every time we get a completely different number. So in order to be able to tell actually what is your effective annual interest rate, you would have to calculate it. So how, we would, how would you calculate the effective interest rate in the first case? The effective interest rate would be, for example, 100 times 1 plus 0 0.08 divided by 4 to the power of 4. This is how many quarters a year has. And then you would get, I don't know, 100 and something dollars. This something dollars would be basically number of percents how much is your effective interest rate. Now using these different ways of compounding, we have defined different ways how to calculate the present value depending on which rate do you know. Do you know nominal interest rate, how often is compounding, etc. And we said present value of one cash flow, this is why I call it C1. C1 comes from the fact that currently we live in the world where we have only one cash flow that takes place in time t. If the compounding is done in discrete time, by discrete I mean maybe quarterly, annually, whatever, then you calculate the present value by dividing this cash flow but 1 plus r to the power of, of t. Or in other words, multiplying it by the corresponding discount factor. If the thing is in continuous time, then you have to divide everything by e to the power of rt, or multiplying by e to the minus rt, which is the same thing. And in this simple world, where we had one cash flow, we said that the net present value is the present value of this cash flow minus the required investment that we have done today. And we said net present value rule tells us do the project if the net present value is positive. Or you could use the rate of return rule, which tells you I will do the project if it offers me more percent, more return than the alternatively risky, the, the alternative but similarly risky project. And we said that Actually, this concept of net present value is making jobs for managers easy, in a sense. 
that if firm is owned by two investors, one which is very impatient, like my neighbor, who is 75 years old and wants to go to vacation to Brazil as much as she can before she dies, or if she wants, or some other family that wants to save money for the kid's education. It doesn't matter. Manager, if he is increasing shareholders' value, if he's increasing the net present value of the company, everybody is better off. Even the lady that is going to die next year when he invests in a good project because she can borrow money. And now we move to the chapter three. And in the chapter three, we want to make these things, we want to make these things, you know, proper, useful, because there is no investment that you invest today and in a year from now you get something. I mean, this is very idealistic world. In the idealistic, in the proper world, you have many cash flows. You know, you invest today, you invest tomorrow, you invest in three years from now, and you get return on your investment back over the next 20 years. This is how real world looks like. And we will devise some special shortcuts. And these special shortcuts is something that I believe everybody should know. Not you, everybody who graduated from their high school, maybe even elementary school should know. And we will see why. So this is what we have done so far. We said, if you have one cash flow, multiply this cash flow with the corresponding discount factor, and you will get the present value of this cash flow. What does it mean? It, you will get what money makes you indifferent today compared to this future cash flow. Now, let's do one example. For example, you just bought a new computer. And bank tells you, uh, the seller, salesperson tells you, no problem, you don't have to pay anything today, but in two years you have to pay us $3,000. I mean, these were kind of common deals in the US before the crisis. You could get computers without paying anything now, but in two years you have to pay them something. But now this is not really so common. And, you know, these are the tools that we have developed in the last class. There is nothing new here. And we ask ourselves, okay, what is the present value of this deal? What is the equivalent amount of money today? Well, you just discount 3,000 with 8% 8 to the 1.08 to the square, and you get $2,572. Basically, which means if you put $2,572 today in a bank, you end up with $3,000 in, in two years from now. Again, one very American example. You have the opportunity to purchase the baseball ball hit by some guy that did something. I mean, this is from the book somewhere, I don't know, maybe from the exercises or something like that. You can see that it was written by Americans. So you <laughs> estimate that this ball in 20 years will be worth 2 million. Somebody in 20 years from now will be willing to pay for it 2 million. And now the question is, okay, you have some money today. You want to invest, you want to invest in your future retirement fund. And, you know, you can do it in alternative ways. You can go to a hedge fund, and hedge funds give you approximately 12% per year. Should I invest in this hedge fund, or should I buy this ball? And you say, well, I will buy this ball if I have to pay less than what I would be, or that what I would need to achieve the same return by investing in a hedge fund. And basically, this is like, what? how much money do I need to put at the 12th? percent interest rate today that after 20 years I get 2 million. This is the same thing. Basically calculate the present value of 2 million at a rate of 12 percent. This is 207,334. And this is the amount. This is the fair value that you would be willing to pay for this. So now let's generalize things. This is, this is the last class things. I mean we were able to do this kind of calculation even the last time. Now let's complicate things a little. Imagine, imagine that you have now not C1, but CT, where CT can be C1, C2, C3, C4. It can be in any period of time. Now we can have many, many Cs, many cash flows. And each one, present value of each one will be basically present value discount, cash flow discounted by the corresponding discount factor. Now, 
Let's introduce some terminology before we start. What's an investment? Now, the textbook definition of the investment would be investment is the current commitment of some resources, current investment of some resources in order to receive some future benefits. I mean, this is naive way looking to the investment or investment science. Why? Because, I mean, all, whenever you invest some money, you eventually get something back. It might be even less. But this is not a good investment. We want to define an investment which is kind of a good investment. So these Cs, this amount of money that you get or amount of money that you invest net in the period of time is what we call a cash flow. So this is some money that you receive or pay in some period of time. And cash flow stream is a collection of these cash flows. So if you, for example, invest $10 today and you get $20 tomorrow, each of these, this $10 minus 10 is a cash flow, plus 20 is a cash flow, but together they are a cash flow stream. So the investment or the invest goal of investment science is to tailor, to create this cash flow stream to be as good as possible, to make it as desirable as possible for you, and not just to invest and get something. Now, how do we denote these cash flow streams? This is one example of a cash flow stream. And usually, this cash flow stream means you invest $100 today and you get $120 back in a period for no, from now. This period from now, depending on the problem, might be in one quarter from now, one year from now, or tomorrow, depending on the problem. But numbers, negative numbers, are usually what you have to pay, basically investments, and positive numbers are what you get back. This is another example of a cash flow stream, which spans over multiple periods, not only two periods. So you invest $100 today, then, for example, in one year from now, you get $10. In two years from now, you get $10 more. In three years from now, you get $10 more. And in four years from now, you get $110 more. This same cash flow stream can be represented with the following diagram at the bottom. If you don't see it on the projector screen, look at the printed version of the slide. So the thing at the bottom is a diagram representation of this cash flow stream. And what's the idea of this diagram? This arrow, this line pointing downwards, this now it's kind of red pointing downwards, since it's below this timeline, it means that it's negative. And usually the length of these lines is proportional to the amount of money. So this represents minus 100. In minus 100 today, this represents investment of 100 today. These three lines above, small lines above the line, are basically you get $10 in a year from now, you get $10 in two years from now, you get $10 in three years from now. And the last line pointing upwards is the last payment that you get is $110. And basically, this is a diagram representation of this, of this cash flow stream. Now the question is, what is the present value of this cash flow stream? What would you be willing to exchange this cash flow stream, if I give you some money today, how much money would you ask in exchange? And you all remember the question that I have asked you. Do you prefer $100 today or $100 in a year from now? I mean, everybody, they agreed. You prefer $100 today. But let me ask you one question. Do you prefer $100 today or $100 today. I mean, this might sound like a very, very trivial question. And it actually is. The answer is, you don't care. I mean, of course. This is like, if I ask you, for example, but let, let's complicate this question a little bit. Do you want me to give you $100 bill today? Or do you want me to give you two $50 bills today? 
I mean, it's the same. You don't care. You're indifferent between these two things. But this simple example sets up a stage for some very important concept, which tells you you can add present values together. You know, $50 today plus $50 today is $100 today. I mean, it is trivial example, but gives a setup for something super, super important and powerful. It gives a setup that you can add present values, and we know how to calculate present value of each cash flow stream. How do we calculate the present value of a cash flow stream that takes place in year one? We discount it with 1 plus r to the power of 1. How do we calculate the present value of cash flow stream that takes place in year two? We discount it with the power of 2. And we can add these two numbers together because this is amount of dollars today and this is amount of dollars today since they are discounted properly. And even though example is trivial, it, you know, it's super important. You can add present values and you cannot add C1 plus C2. You know, $100 in a year from now plus $100 in two years from now. It's not $200 today. We don't know how much is it. But when we discount them, we can add them. So let's do an example. You have $100 in a year from now and $200 in two years from now. How much is this worth in today's dollars? Well, first element of this sum is 100 over 107. So first element is basically $93.46 today. So if I give you $93.46 today, you are indifferent between this and $100 in a year from now. Why? Because if I give you $100 in a year from now, you can go to a bank and borrow $93.46 today and you will repay them this debt because the interest rate is 7%. You'll be able to repay them $100 in a year from now, no problem. So, and the same thing goes for this $200. If you discount them, they are in money today. So you can add these numbers together. So if I offer you now $268.50 today, or $100 in a year from now and $200 in two years from now. Which one do you prefer? Well, you are indifferent. You don't care. Because if you have this amount of money, if you have this amount of money and you put this money to a bank, you put $93.46% and 46 cents today for one year, in one year, it will give you $100. If you put $174.64 for two years, you will receive exactly $200. Therefore, you are indifferent. No matter which one you have, you can replicate the other. Okay, now let's get back to the example where your boss asks you, okay, should I invest in the, in the building construction? Should I create this building? But in the previous example, in the last class, the example was simple. You invest today and you get your money back in a year from now. Now let's complicate this example because in reality, usually you do not build buildings after one year. You need two years to build a building. So in the first year today, basically today, you invest $170,000. In a year from now, you invest $100,000. But after two years, you are able to sell it for $320,000. And I ask you, should you do this or not? Considering that you can invest your money into something which is of a similar risk, which will give you 5% per year. And then you sit down and say, OK, what's the net present value of this? Well, the net present value of the first payment is the first payment, because this takes place today, 170 today is 170 today. What's the net present value of $100,000 in a year from now? Well, we have to discount it with the corresponding discount factor. So 100 times 0 0.952 is $95,238. What is the net present value of $320,000? Well, we have to discount it by 1.05 to the power of 2. It's 
thousand two hundred and forty nine dollars. Now this is all in dollars today. We can add these numbers together, and this leads you to a number of twenty five thousand and eleven dollars. Now the question is, some might say, okay, but this is only twenty five thousand dollars more than what I. You know, I earn only $25,000 and I'm investing a lot. I'm investing like more than like $270,000. But you know, in this sentence, there are so many fallacies that it's even difficult to describe. You are not investing $270,000. That's number one. Because you invest one hundred and seventy dollars today and you invest $100,000 in a year from now. That's not $270,000. That's actually a bit less. But... What's important, this net present value doesn't tell you how much you make. It tells you how much money in today's dollars you make more than you would if you would invest in a project that would give you 5%, which we said is a project of a similar risk. So this is how much more you make in dollars today then you would if you invest in something of a similar risk. This is what the net present value is. So if this is only one dollar, this is good because you make more than you otherwise would. This doesn't make you make one dollar more than if you don't do anything. This means you make one dollar more than you would if you invest in something that is similarly risky. This is the diagram representation of the same problem. I mean, there is nothing, nothing different. <coughs> now, we are moving to the interesting part of this class. We basically want to derive some formulas. We want to derive formulas that you can tell your mom, that you can tell your dad. I mean, if you understand the formula, formula will at the end be very simple. Derivation is a little bit complex, but the formula at the end is very, very simple, and I believe everybody should be able to use these formulas. Now let's see what are these formulas. To come to a really, really useful formula, we have to deal with some little bit abstract thing. So what's the little abstract thing? The abstract thing is called perpetuity. Perpetuity, just try to remember it as something as goes forever. So it's perpetuous. It repeats perpetually. It goes forever and ever and ever again. So perpetuity is a financial concept that pays you a fixed amount of money in every period of time, starting in a period from now, and then it goes forever. So this is like, if C is 100, that means that, for example, and the time period is one year, a time period can be whatever, it can be one month, it can be one week, it can be one day. But let's say it's a one year. If it's a one year and you receive one, let's say, one million dollars every year. So then perpetuity would be, in a year from now, you receive one million dollars. In two years from now, you receive one million dollars. In three years from now, you receive one million dollars. And forever, every year, you receive one million dollars. Now the question is, what is the present value of such financial concept? Naively, you could think, well, this is infinite amount of money. Because, you know, this is infinite number of payments. You will receive infinitely many payments of one million from next year until the eternity. <laughs> but let's observe what is, actually, what is actually present value of this thing. Well, it will be C divided by 1 plus R. This is the first cash flow. We discount it with the corresponding discount factor. Plus C divided by 1 plus R to the square plus c divided by 1 plus r to the power of 3. It goes forever like that. And now, there is something that some people that I have asked in the previous groups, they tell me we have learned this in our high school, and some people say we haven't learned it in our high school. But it's actually pretty simple, and I will explain it for those that haven't learned it in the high school. What's the idea? 
The idea is that this sum that goes 1 plus x plus x to the square plus x to the third plus x to the fourth plus x to the fifth, etc. This is what is called a geometric series. And this sum, you know, this is a sum on, of infinite numbers, will actually be finite. It will sum up to a number if x is basically between 0 and 1. If x is smaller than 1 and larger than 0, this sum will sum up to some number. To give you an example, which number, for example, x equal to 1 half is between 0 and 1. Then the first element will be 1 plus 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 over 16, etc. So what would be the sum of the first two elements? It would be 1 plus 1 half. Sum of first three elements, it would be 1 plus 1 half plus 1 quarter. This is like 1 and 3 quarters, etc. And you add these numbers, and this will be equal to exactly 2. So this infinite sum will be equal to 1 over 1 minus x. So if x is 1 half, then this sum will be equal to 1 over 1 minus 1 half, which is 1 half. So 1 over 1 half, this is 2. So all these numbers, if x is 1 half, will sum up to 2. It might sound incredible to some of you by your faces, but it's not. I mean, this is actually high school math, and I, I build, I'm quite certain that you have learned this in high school. But okay, let's observe our present value. We said our present value looks like this. It's c over 1 plus r, plus c over 1 plus r to the square, plus c over 1 plus r to the power of 3. Now, let's rearrange things just a little bit. Let's take c over 1 plus r kind of in front of parentheses. If we take it in front of parentheses, you end up with the bottom equation. You end up with this thing over here. And you know, this thing, this thing in this large parenthesis looks a little bit like this geometric series. And actually, if you define x as 1 over 1 plus r, this becomes c over 1 plus r. And, you know, if x is equal to 1 plus r, then this is 1 plus x plus x to the square plus x to the third plus x to the fourth, etc. Okay? This is just a substitution. We haven't done anything. And we know that if you know, if x is between 0 and 1, then we know that this infinite sum actually can be replaced by 1 over 1 minus x. We know that this, these are the same things. If x is between 0 and 1. And you know, r in our problems is always some positive number. Because, you know, you can always compare yourself for, with doing nothing. And doing nothing means keeping money in your pocket. And this is r equal to 0. So when you compare some investment with some other investment, it must, must offer you positive r. If r is not positive, investment is useless. By definition, if it doesn't offer, if you invest money and you get the same money back. I mean, you can do exactly the same by keeping the money in your pocket. So r is always positive. If r is always some positive number, then 1 over 1 plus r is always smaller than 1 and positive. Therefore, this condition is always satisfied. So we can always replace 1 plus x plus x to the square plus x to the third, etc., with 1 over 1 minus x. Now let's do that. Let's, repla let's replace this thing with 1 over 1 minus x. If we do this, then the present value becomes c over 1 plus r times, instead of this infinite sum, we get 1 over 1 minus x. And x is here 1 over 1 plus r. So we continue from this equation. Now, the question is, what is this 1 over 1 minus x? What is this thing? Well, we know what is x, so we can plug in x. So let's see what is 1 over 1 minus x. And let's see that by plugging in actually this x into 1 over 1 minus x. 
If we plug this in, we get something like this. And now, just put things to the common denominator, which is 1 plus r. Then this 1 becomes 1 plus r minus 1. And this simplifies to 1 plus r over r. Now, in our original equation, c over 1 plus r times 1 over 1 minus x, we can actually, we know that 1 over 1 minus x is 1 plus r over r. So we can replace this thing over here. We can just plug it in here. And we end up with something like this. And 1 plus r and 1 plus r cancel out. And you end up with c over r. So the present value of a financial concept called perpetuity, which gives you a payment c that starts in a year from now and continues for eternity, is as simple as c over r. And this condition is always satisfied, so this, this expression basically always holds. Because 1 over 1 plus r is always between 0 and 1 because r is some positive number. So this is important thing. And we will see just a little bit later why is this important. OK. Imagine. I mean, many people are doing this kind of, many people are doing this kind of thought exercises. Many people dream about, okay, when I get rich, I will retire and I will live out of interest that banks gives me. I will have lots of money and I will put lots of money to the bank and I will live on the interest. I won't work. This is dream of many, many people. And let's see how it works with our concept. How can we use this kind of thought, thought exercises that many people do? How we can use this to actually derive our formula C over R in much easier and more intuitive way. So imagine that you are rich. You have one million dollars. And you put this one million dollars in a bank. And bank tells you, OK, no problem. We give you 8% interest annually. That means that if you put $1 million today in a bank, you will, in a year from now, receive 8%, which is 80000 And now, you know, you want to live on interest. So you take this interest of 80000 and you spend it all. And you invest this remaining $1 million to a bank again. So 1 million stays invested in a bank, and you spend each year $80,000. This is like, I don't know, 7,000 per month, something like that, 80 divided by 12. So you can spend approximately $7,000 per month, which is nice money. If you have $1 million in a bank, and you can actually do it forever. Because if you keep $1 million in a bank, if you invest $1 million in a bank today, bank will give you every year 8% of interest on top of this $1 million. And you get these 8% and you spend them all. So what do we learn from this thought exercise? If you have $1 million in a bank and if R is 8%, then you will get $80,000 every year forever. So what does it mean? That means that you are basically indifferent. You don't care whether somebody gives you $1 million now or they give you $80,000 every year. This makes you totally indifferent. Because if you have $1 million now and you put them in a bank, bank will give you 8%. So you will be able to spend $80,000 every year starting from next year till forever. So you're indifferent between these two things. So it must be that this $1 million is actually a present value. And present value times interest rate is equal to the cash flow that you receive forever. And here we come to our formula. Present value is equal C over R. 
This is a much simpler way. We don't talk about the geometric series and stuff, and we have, in a sense, derived exactly the same formula. Now let's do one example. What is the present value of $100,000 every year for eternity, so you receive first payment in a year from now, and forever and ever you receive $100,000 every year. And the interest rate is 10%. Well, present value is C over R. C is $100,000, R is 10%. Basically, the answer is 1 million. Basically, if you put 1 million in a bank, and you receive 10% interest, you will receive every year forever and ever $100,000. <coughs> this is conditional that you take this $100,000 and you spend them. There is no compounding. Them. But now, one thing where people are making mistakes from year to year in the exam every year. So I will try to repeat and repeat the following sentence. Timing, the timing here is very, very important. I said formula C over R works. It's correct when the first payment starts in a year from now, not today, not in three years from now, not in 10 years, from, but when it, the first payment <coughs> is in a year from now. So let's now try to solve the following problem. Imagine that you have a perpetuity that gives you amount of C every year, but it doesn't start in year one, it starts in year two. So in two years from now, you get your first payment. What is the present value of this cash flow stream? Now, if we stand in year one, if we are currently in year one, from the perspective of year one, this looks just like a normal perpetuity. You know, if now is not year zero, if it's not today, if it's year one, then this cash flow looks exactly the same like a normal perpetuity, meaning it starts from year, from the next year. So from year one, this will look exactly the same like the following cash flow. So I put index one, you see present value one. This is not a present value. This is how would this look like from the perspective of year one? So from the perspective of year one, you are indifferent between C over R in year one and the top cash flow, which I call CFA, cash flow A. So cash flow A and cash flow B are something that you are indifferent with. Why? Because if somebody gives you amount of C over R in year one, and you put it in a bank at the rate R. You will get exactly the thing on top. You will get exactly CFA. But you know, this is not the present value. This is in year one. So how do we calculate the present value? Well, you know, this is just some number. This is just some amount of money in year one. This is C over R dollars. This is $100, 100,000. This is some number of dollars in year one. How do you calculate the present value of this? Well, you just have to discount it. You just have to multiply it by the corresponding discount factor. And since this is a cash flow that takes place in year one, you have to discount it with one plus R. Okay, let's do another example. I'm doing so many examples because this is a very common mistake. People say, Perpetuity, present value is C over R. It is, but only if it starts paying you in year one. If it starts paying you in year five, like here, what is the present value of this? Well, looked from the perspective of year four, this is equivalent to this cash flow. This is like somebody gives you C over R in the year four. And what is the present value of this thing over here? Can somebody tell me? times 1 over 1 plus R um, to the power of 5. To the power of 4, because this is in year 4. You see? This is important thing. Don't mix things up. You know, if you look at this slide, first payment of this thing starts in year 5. But from year 4, this looks like a 
perpetuity. Because perpetuity is an asset that starts paying in a year from now. So from the perspective of year four, this looks like C over R. And in order to discount something from year four to year zero, from to today, you have to discount it with one plus r to the power of four. Keep in mind, I mean, people always either don't discount in the exam or they use the wrong number. Like they would discount here with one plus r to the power of five. It's wrong. It's one plus r to the power of four. And now we have developed, now we know everything to come up with the most important equation of this class. And this is how to calculate the present value of something called annuity. And the annuity is financial concept in which a constant cash flow is theoretically received, not forever, but for some period of time. And why is this important? You know, when you look at perpetuity, this is some obscure thing that you can use to dream about, okay, if I get rich, how much money do I need to put in a bank to receive some fixed amount forever and live on interest? Or it can, perpetuity can be useful also, there are financial assets called perpetual bonds, and they exist. And what's the point of these assets? So British government, during the World War II, needed money, and they needed money desperately. And they said, we will issue this piece of paper, which is called perpetual bond, and, who, and we will sell it today. We will give it to somebody who is willing to pay for it something now. But in exchange, we promise you that every year, forever and ever, we will pay you some amount of money annually. So if you own one piece of paper, I give you 1,000 British pound every year forever. But you know, you can calculate what's the present value of that. It's C over R. That's it. That's as simple as that. You can calculate how much money would somebody be willing to pay for this piece of paper. It would be willing to pay, somebody would be willing to pay present value. And what's the present value? Well, it, if it pays you 1,000 British pounds per year and the current riskless rates are, I don't know, 2%, you, discount, you just divide 1,000 over 2% and that's it. Okay. But now we are coming to something more useful. You know, these are kind of obscure financial assets. They don't, they are not really popular. But we come to a financial asset that is very popular. That pays a fixed amount of money C over some period of time. Not infinite. And I mean, this is a loan. This is, every loan looks like this basically. You take a loan from a bank, bank gives you money today, and in exchange, you have to pay them constant amount of time over some period. If you take a mortgage on your house, you will have to pay every month some amount of money for next, let's say, 30 years. These are typical, typical loans. And we want to be able to calculate the present value of this thing. And we will see in the examples how useful this thing is. So, how do we calculate the present value of this? Well, you can do it by hand. You can just discount every cash flow with the corresponding <coughs> discount factor. Now, what's the problem with this? I mean, this is easy to do when you have five elements in this sum. But imagine you have, you're buying a house and you have to pay every month for next 30 years. That's 360 elements in this sum. To calculate this by hand, I mean, you can do it, but it will take some time. But let's, so let's, let's come up with a formula that will help us deal with this. So, so far we have learned how to calculate present value of this cash flow C at the bottom of the slide. This cash flow C at the bottom, this is just a normal perpetuity. Cash flow B, is also a perpetuity, but which doesn't start paying in year one, but starts paying in year t plus one. We also know how to calculate present value of this. Now we want to learn how to calculate present value of cash flow A. But observe one thing on this slide. It should be obvious that actually cash flow A plus cash flow B is exactly the same thing as cash flow C. If I offer you, do you want 
cash flow C or do you want cash flow B and C, A and B? It's the same thing. You are indifferent because they will give you exactly the same amount of money at exactly the same period of time. So we can easily say that A plus B is equal to C. This is like elementary school math now. Now, but we know also that present values are additive. So we can say that the present value of cash flow A plus present value of cash flow B, it must be exactly the same as the present value of cash flow C because you are indifferent between these two things. Therefore, it must be true, and we want to find present value of cash flow A. It must be true that present value of cash flow A is exactly the same thing as present value of C minus present value of B. And you know, if present value of A is equal to present value of C minus present value of B, and you know, present value of C, this is just the normal perpetuity that we know how to calculate. Present value of B, we also know how to calculate. So what's the present value of C? It's C over R. What's the present value of B? <coughs> C over R, and we have to discount it because, you know, from period T, it looks exactly like a normal perpetuity, so it's C over R, but we have to discount it from time T to time zero. So we discount it with 1 plus R to the power of T. So present value of the annuity is present value of C minus present value of B, which gives us this formula, present value of a is equal to C over R minus C over R times 1 over 1 plus R to the power of T. And we come to the slide that is summarizing all these formulas. In this slide, you have everything summarized. But please pay attention on the timing. Timing is super important here. First formula perpetuity, C over R, works when your first payment is in year one. So in a year from now, or in a month from now, in one period of time from now. The second formula works when your first payment is in period T plus one. And you know, this second formula is just the general formula. If you, type, if you, if you say, okay, if, what if T is zero? Then your per first payment in the second equation starts in t plus 1, in 0 plus 1 year from now. So if t is equal to 0, which means your first payment starts in t plus 1, in 1 year from now, then this becomes c over r times 1 over 1 plus r to the power of 0. This is 1. So it's c over r. It's the same thing when t is equal to 0. And the second formula, the last formula, the third formula, is for the annuity. So this is an asset, the, the financial instrument that pays you amount of C in first time in year one, and then in every period of time until T, including both one and T. So both are included, one and T, but there is no payment at zero, there is no payment in T plus one, but there are payments in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and T. So let's see why is this annuity formula so important for everyday life. Imagine that you go to a car dealer, you want to buy some BMW, and car dealer tells you, okay, no problem, you don't have to pay everything now, you can pay $5,000 every year. And your first payment is due in a year from now. What's the present value of this car? How much you would have to pay today for this car, in a sense? Well, you can calculate present values by discounting each element of this cash flow stream. But you can also insert this into the annuity formula, C over R, where C is 5,000 and R is 7%. C over R minus C over R times 1 over 1 plus R to the power of T. But you know, in reality, in real life, when you go to a car dealer, you almost never get this kind of deal that you have to make annual payments. 
And you know, with annual payments, it doesn't matter if you use formula, if it's for five years, it's easy to discount five numbers. In reality, this is how it looks like. You agree to, le to lease a car for four years. And you have to pay $300 per month starting in a month from now. But pay attention on timing. In a month from now. You don't pay the first payment today. You pay first payment in a month from now. So let's say that the interest rate is 0.5% per month. What is the actual value of this car? Well, now, you know, four years, 12 months, this is 48 elements in the sum. You could do it, but it would take some time. But you can just plug in things in the formula that we have derived. You can just plug in here. So your C is 300. So C over R minus C over R discounted 1 plus 0 0.05 to the power of 48. This is now in months. This is why we have here 48. And the interest rate is monthly interest rate. This is important. And this is basically equivalent to $12,774.1. I mean, you can check in Excel that you will get exactly the same number if you do it month by month and discount each, each element of the sum by the appropriate discount factor. But, I mean, this is not actually in reality how you think and how it's useful. So now let's try to solve some problem using this formula that, you know, everybody is facing sooner or later in their lives. Almost everybody. Almost everybody will need a loan for something sometimes in their life. So for example, let's say that a guy that works downstairs in cafeteria saw one really nice house in the Rheingau and wants to buy it and goes to, to a person that sells the house, asks him, okay, what's the price of this house? And the guy tells him, it's a half a million dollars. And this guy says, Oof, I don't have half a million dollars. I, I have saved $80,000. Can I afford to buy this house? Well, I don't know. Depends on his salary. But how much he would have to pay per month in order to buy this house? Let's check. So imagine the situation is following. House costs 500000 He has saved 80,000 and he can pay these 80,000. So he needs to go to a bank and ask a bank, could you give me a loan on $420,000? And bank tells him, okay, no problem, we give you a loan and the interest rate is 5% per month. So how much this guy would have to pay per month to this bank to repay this loan? Well, this is just an annuity. So every month, he will pay a constant amount of money to the bank. And we want to calculate what is this C, how much he should pay. Well, first of all, how many periods there are. He has to pay every month for 30 years. That is 360 months. What's the present value? Well, bank gives him $420,000 today. And we know that this equation must be satisfied. That this 420 must be equal to this thing over here on the right. C over R minus C over R times 1 over 1 plus R to the power of T. So we want to calculate C. We want to calculate the amount of his monthly payment. How do we do it? Well, just plug in the numbers in this equation and solve for C. And this is elementary school maths, these are fractions. These are no e to the power of something. And you end up with $2,518 per month. Well, if his wife is also employed, I don't know his salary, but there is a chance that this guy as a family could actually afford this 30 years loan. I doubt it. <laughs> but maybe. But this is the idea. This is the idea. And you see how useful this formula is? I mean, this is what everybody needs. And this is what, you, you know, this formula, you can learn it in your elementary school. And actually, they were learning it in the US in 1895. <laughs> if you remember from my introductory class, they were learning these kind of things in elementary school in 1895. Okay, now we have used the most useful formula on this class. 
And now you can, if your dad asks you, okay, how much do I have to pay for a house? How much do I have to, you can calculate this for your dad easily. But now let's deal with some other financial assets. Let's deal with the constant growth perpetuity. What's a constant growth perpetuity? It's also a financial asset that keeps paying you some amount of money forever. But this amount of money is growing over time. It's increasing over time. So in year one, you get C1 amount of money. In year two, you receive G percent more. Let's say that G is 10%. That means that if, if in year one you have received $100, and if G is 10%, C2 is equal to $110. And each year after you receive 10% more than in the previous year. So C2 is C1 times 1 plus G. That's clear. Then C3 is the same thing as C2 times 1 plus G. And we know that C2 is actually C1 times 1 plus G. So we can write it as C1 times 1 plus G squared. And for every element, every element in this cash flow stream can be expressed in terms of C1 and G. Every element in this increasing series. This is what is called growing perpetuity. This is infinite number of payments. They go to eternity but they increase at the rate g. So now the question is, how much is this worth today? What's the present value of this thing? Well, naively we could say this is infinite amount of money. But it turns out that sometimes it's infinite, but sometimes it's not infinite. Sometimes it's a finite amount of money. And let's see how do we get to this now. So, we start exactly the same as with the perpetuity. It's C1 over 1 plus R, plus C2 over 1 plus R to the square, plus C3 over 1 plus R to the square. But now we can replace C1 stays C1 over 1 plus R. But C2 is what? It's C1 times 1 plus G. So we can replace it here. C3 is 1 plus G to the square times C1, etc. We can replace all elements with C1, all C elements, C4, C5, C6, we can express them in terms of C1. And now let's do the, exactly the same thing. Let's take in front of the parenthesis C1 over 1 plus R. And we get to something that again looks like a again looks like a geometric series. Just, you know, if you take that x, if you take that your x is not 1 over 1 plus r like before, but let's say that x is 1 plus g over 1 plus r, then this becomes again like a geometric series. And again, we will be able to replace this infinite sum with 1 over 1 minus x under the condition that x is between 0 and 1. And we will see when this is satisfied. I have a question. What is the difference between G and R? So G is the growth rate. This is how much money do you get more each time. And R is the rate that you use to discount. So R is the discount rate. So you know, you calculate present values when you discount with R. This is some discount rate. This is the rate of the alternative similarly risky investment. This is your some people call it opportunity cost of capital. This is what else you could do with your money instead of investing in this kind of cash flow stream. So this is R. And G tells you the relationship between C1 and C2. So C2, as I said, is C1 times 1 plus G. So you see how these lines are growing over time? Each one of them is 10% larger than the previous one, or G percent larger than the previous one. So if G is 10%, then C2 is 10% larger than C1. Then C3 is 10% larger than C2, etc. So this is G. G is the growth rate. This is how much more money you get in each time period. And R 
is the discount rate. This is what you could get if you invest into something alternative. So what do we conclude? We say that this infinite sum, 1 plus x plus x to the square, where x is 1 plus g over 1 plus r, this can be replaced with 1 over 1 minus x if x is between 0 and 1. So if we replace it, then we again get a similar thing, like previously. We get c1 over 1 plus r times 1 over 1 minus x. So we have this thing over here. <coughs> Now again, let's do something similar. Let's plug in back. Let's see what is this 1 over 1 minus x. What is 1 over 1 minus x? Well, we can again plug in x in this term. If we plug in x here, we get that 1 over 1 minus x is exactly the same thing as 1 plus r over r minus g. These are exactly the same things. 1 over 1 minus x, where x is 1 plus g over 1 plus r, is the same thing as 1 plus r over r minus g. So in our equation, which tells us that the present value is c1 over 1 plus r times 1 over 1 minus x, we can replace 1 over 1 minus x with this thing, with 1 plus r over r minus g. We just replace it over here. And then we get to the c1 over 1 plus r times 1 plus r over r minus g. And then again 1 plus r and 1 plus r cancel out and we get that the present value of this thing is c1 over r minus g. Now, the question is, is this really, is this x really between 0 and 1? Well, we see that x is 1 plus g over 1 plus r. First of all, let's see whether it's larger than 0. So we know that 1 plus r is always a positive number. So in order for this fraction to be positive, 1 plus g needs to be positive. So. If g is larger than minus 1, then this thing is positive. And you know, g will always be larger in 1 in a perpetuity. Why? Imagine that g is equal to minus 1. What does it mean? It means that your first payment is c1, then the next payment is 100% less than that. That's 0. And then you're done. There is no perpetuity. You have only one payment. But if it's, let's say, minus 7%, then you can have infinitely long decreasing streams of payment. If G is positive, you will have infinitely long increasing streams of payment. So we know for sure that X is larger than zero. Now the question is, what happens when is X smaller than one? Well, we can check that. That means that one plus G over one plus R needs to be smaller than 1. When, is the, when this holds? Well, this holds when 1 plus g is smaller than 1 plus r. And this holds only when g is smaller than r. This holds only when g is smaller than r. So the formula that we have derived for the perpetuity is not universal. It holds only when g is smaller than r, when growth rate is smaller than the discount rate. But what happens if g is larger than r? If g is larger than r, then x, then our x, which is 1 plus g over 1 plus r, if g is larger than r, is larger than 1. And you know what does that mean? It means that you are summing up numbers. 1 plus x plus x to the square plus x to the third, where x is larger than 1. This is infinite sum. This is infinity. This is then the present value becomes infinite amount of money. So let me give you an example of a perpetuity, of a growing perpetuity. So this is a growing perpetuity, not a perpetuity. This is a growing perpetuity. You have one million in a bank, 
and bank gives you 8% of interest, but you say, I don't want to live on all my interest. I want to spend just half of the interest and half I will invest to increase my principal. So my principal will grow and my payments over time will grow. So in the first year, if I spend 50 and I invest 50, I will get 40,000 and reinvest 40,000 together with the 1 million of the principal. So R is 8% and G is 4%. So each year, my payment will be 4% larger because I'm saving half of the money that I have get. And then if you plug in numbers here, everything will work. C1 over R minus G. But note that unlike in perpetuity, where you have C over R, C1 over R minus G is here. Because you know, every cash flow stream is different. C1 is not the same thing as C2. So if you want to calculate from the perspective, let's say, if your first payment is not in the year one, it's not C1, it starts, let's say, it's T plus one, then you can calculate again the present value using the same trick. You first calculate the present value in time T, and then you discount it back. But know that this is not C1, this is CT plus one. And now let me give you two examples that people don't believe me that they are correct. But believe me, they are correct. People are shocked when they see these numbers. Imagine that I give you the following cash flow stream. I tell you, in a year from now, and look, timing is important here. I'm not saying I give you today one billion. In a year from now, I give you one billion dollars. And in two years from now, I give you even more. I give you $1.04 billion. I give you 4% more. And for every year after, I give you 4% more. And I ask you, how much money is that worth today? This is a growing perpetuity. And if the discount rate is 10%, this is not worth infinite amount of money. This is worth some number. And this number is 16.66666 forever six billion dollars. Now, let me contrast this with a different example. I tell you, I give you one dollar not one billion, I give you one dollar in a year from now. And then I give you every year 4% more. So in two years I give you one dollar and four cents. But let's pretend that the interest rate is not 10%, but 2%. How much is this worth? Well, this is worth much more than the previous example. This is worth infinite amount of money. Because the growth rate is higher than the discount rate. You cannot use the, perpetuity, the growing perpetuity formula. This is just infinite amount of money because it grows very, very fast in a sense. It grows faster than you discount it. Now in order to understand these two examples, let's observe into details what is going on in these two examples. So how does the diagram representation looks like of the first example? In the first example, in year one, you receive one billion. In year two, you receive 4% more. You receive 1.4 billion. In year three, you receive 4% more. And forever it grows. But in example two, you start with one dollar. In year two, you receive one dollar and four cents. And you receive four cents more. Now, but pay attention. When you want to calculate the present value, you are not summing up C1 plus C2 plus C3. You are summing up their present values. You are not summing up cash flows. You are summing up present value. Because if you were summing up cash flows, sum of these cash flows on top is infinite. So 1 billion plus 1.4 billion plus 1.16 billion. I mean, this is all infinite amount if it was summed like that. But you're not summing up these numbers. You're summing up present values. And let's observe how present values look like. 
What's the present value of cash flow one? Present value of cash flow one is one billion divided by one point one. Present value of cash flow two is one point zero four billion divided by one point one to the square. What's the present value of the third cash flow? 1 billion times 1.04 to the square divided by 1.1 to the third. And note that these are present values. So this is this present value 2 doesn't mean, as in the previous example, present value looked from the perspective of time 2. No, this is the real present value. This is the present value of the cash flow 2. This is how much dollars this is worth today. And if you do the same exercise for the example number two, you will see that if you discount these numbers, you will get numbers that are still larger and larger with times. Because this grows at the rate which is larger than the rate that you use for discount. So in terms of present value, example two is increasing. In terms of present value, example one is decreasing. Since Present values are decreasing with time. You can sum them up to some number. But in the example two, sum of an increasing series of numbers is infinite sum. And finally, we derive the last formula for this class, which is exactly the same using exactly the same principles like we used to derive the annuity formula. So what's the idea? We want to calculate what is the present value of the growing annuity. We want to calculate what's the present value of the growing annuity. What does it mean? It grows for some period of time. So it grows until time t. But then again, we know that this will be basically, if you sum it up with the growing perpetuity that starts in period t plus 1, it will be exactly the same as this, this cash flow c. So again, a plus b is equal to c. Exactly the same idea. a plus b is equal to c. This is obvious. So present value of a plus present value of b must be equal to present value of c. Therefore, Present value of A that we want to calculate must be present value of C minus present value of B. So what is the present value of C? What is the present value of C? This is just the growing annuity, normal growing annuity. Can somebody tell me what's the present value of C? I mean, this is C1 over R minus G. But pay attention, this is C1. This is the annuity that starts in period 1. So it's C1 divided by R minus G. OK, so present value of A is present value of C minus present value of B. We know what is present value of C. Now we need to calculate what's the present value of B. And what's B? B is a growing annuity that starts, first payment starts in period T plus 1. So looked from the perspective of time t, this will just be ct plus 1, which is the amount of the first payment. So first payment is ct plus 1 divided by r minus g. This is how much this is worth in time t. But how much is it worth today? Well, we have to discount it with 1 plus r to the power of t. And this is how much is it worth. But now we can express ct plus 1 in terms of C1, Ct plus 1 is the same thing as C1 times 1 plus G to the power of T. You remember, C2 is C1 times 1 plus G. C3 is C1 times 1 plus G to the square. Therefore, Ct plus 1 is C1 times 1 plus G to the power of T. And we can plug in this all. So present value of C we have found present value of B we know, and present value of A is given by this formula. Now, let me give you examples how to use this formula. 
And please now pay attention. People again often make mistakes with using with the usage of this formula. And they don't use them properly because they don't understand the essence. And now I'm trying to tell you what's the essence of these formulas. Imagine the following example. What is the present value of a growing annuity whose first payment is $1 in a one year from now, and the payments grow at rate of 4%, and there are 10 payments. What does it mean? That means you have a first payment in a year from now of $1. In two years from now, you get $1.04. In three years from now, you get $1.04 to the square dollars, etc. Until, I mean, there are 10 payments. So this is limited amount. This is not infinite. This is 10 payments. And you can calculate this present value of this by discounting these 10 numbers with the corresponding discount factors. But you can also plug them in into this equation. C1 over R minus G minus C1 over R minus G times 1 plus G over 1 plus R to the power of T. So what is G? What is G here? It's 4%. What's R? It's 10%. What is T here? It's 10. And if you plug in these numbers into this formula, you get $7.155. And note, here, the growth rate is 4%, while the discount rate is 10%. But now, let's do the example when the growth rate is 4% and the discount rate is 2%. But pay attention. Now, I'm trying to tell you what is the common mistake that people do in the exam. So, now we have the growing annuity. It gives you, let's say, 10 payments. It doesn't give you infinite amount of payments. And I ask you, okay, the growth rate is 4%, while the discount rate is 2%. That means growth rate is higher than 2%. If this was the growing perpetuity, this would be infinite amount of money. But this is not the growing perpetuity. These are 10 payments. So this cannot be infinite amount of money. And it turns out that actually this formula for the growing, perpetu growing annuity works. If you plug in numbers, you will get some number. This is $10.716. This is not infinite amount of money, even though the growth rate is higher than the discount rate. And why it's not infinite? Come on, this is just some payment. This is just 10 numbers that you have to discount with the corresponding discount factor. This cannot be infinite. Sum of ten, any 10 numbers is a number. It's not infinite amount of money. You want to ask something? No. So, all these formulas are summarized in this slide. And pay attention on the timing. Timing is super important. People often make mistakes with timing. Timing is very important. So C1 over R minus G formula works if your first payment is in a year from now and then continues until eternity. And it gr payments grow with the rate G. And you discount with the rate R. In the second formula, first payment is in year T plus 1. And the size of the payment in the year t plus 1 is ct plus 1. It's not c1. It's ct plus 1. And ct plus 1 is the same thing as ct times 1 plus g, or is the same thing as c1 times 1 plus g to the power of t. And the last formula, the growing annuity, it goes from year 1 until year t. If it starts at year zero, this formula does not work. You have to adjust it a little bit. And you know how. I'm sure you are able to figure out how. And now we come to a mistake in a book. There is a mistake in a book. If you look, there is a table in your book. And actually, mistake is not present in every edition of the book. In the latest edition, it's corrected. In the older edition, it's present. So if you look at this bottom element over here, if you look at the bottom part of this 
table. Right bottom corner, there is one thing missing. And on top of, the, of this element over here, on top of the rightmost fraction in this equation, there is 1 plus g to the power of 3 missing. So this is basically a formal formula from the for the growing and growing. This is this should be actually you see here it says growing three year annuity. It should say growing three year annuity, but then you should have one plus g to the power of three since it's a three year annuity. And actually here they start with dollar with one dollar, C1 is one. Here C1 is one. And if you look at our formula that we have here, it's C1 over R minus G minus C1 over R minus G times one plus G to the power of T. Since in their case, C1 is one dollar, if you look at this slide again, you will have here. C1, which is 1, over R minus G minus C1, but we are missing here. We are missing here one thing. We are missing here 1 plus G to the power of 3. As much as I'm concerned, this class is over. If you have any questions, please ask.